Hello, and welcome to the webinar, When Fire Hits. My name is Aaron Groth, and I am your host, the Regional Fire Specialist for the Coast with Oregon State University's Extension Fire Program. This webinar is part of a webinar series meant to help prepare Oregonians for the wildfire season. Today, you will hear about how fire operations and levels of response are assembled, what you can expect if you are in an affected area, as well as some ideas for how you can make firefighters' jobs easier and safer if they need to protect your home. Overall, the webinar series aims to address preparedness at three levels, individual, community, and the landscape. Coming up, we'll have a session on recovery after a fire. It is our intention to provide broad level information in these webinars and then provide local online meetings that will dial this information in for your area or county. And because you signed up for this webinar, you will receive information for those area specific meetings. So stay tuned and feel free to visit the online webinar guide for updates. Logistics. Okay, before we begin the presentations, I have some webinar logistics that I'd like to quickly cover. This session is being recorded and all webinar recordings can be found on the FNR YouTube channel. We're also streaming live on the Extensions Facebook page. There is also closed captioning feature, so hopefully you are all seeing that at the bottom of your screens. If you do not want to see the captioning, simply go to the live transcript and hide subtitles. For the people tuning into the webinar on Zoom, your audio has been muted. If you are having audio troubles and are connected to your computer's audio, I suggest hanging up and dialing in with your phone. You can always post a question in the chat window if you are having technical difficulties. Um, if you have a question on the information that is being presented, please type your question into uh, the chat. Um, for this webinar, we do not have the Q&A window uh, available. Uh, we have limited time, but we will do our best to answer your questions live. If you don't catch all the information presented, don't worry, we will provide all the resources and links mentioned during this webinar on our FIRE program website. And we'll even follow up with an email just to be sure you get the information. Okay, so let's get this webinar started. I want to first introduce Katie Wolstein and Jacob Putney. Katie is our moderator today and is the Rangeland FIRE Regional Specialist. Katie will select questions to answer live. Uh, Jacob is our co-host today and is a forestry and natural resource extension agent for Baker and Grant counties. Uh, I would also like to mention Chris Adlam, regional fire specialist for the Southwest, who couldn't join us today, but has played a pivotal role in the organization of this event. Uh, our three presenters today will introduce themselves. Daniel Lavelle will be addressing how the response to wildfires comes together. Kelly Burns of Ashland Fire and Rescue will be bringing a firefighter's perspective on responding to fires and structure protection. Jennifer Case of the Oregon Department of Forestry will be discussing how to get real-time information about fires, as well as some terms people might hear in the media. We also have panelists on the line to assist with questions, including some of the new Extension Fire Program team. Okay, setting the stage. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so a recap, please see your resource packets. Um, the link is included. Um, so what? It's about wildfire preparedness and specifically today, uh, response to wildfire. Who is this targeted for? People, communities, and landscapes. Uh, how to prepare yourself and your home for wildfire evacuation. How to work as a community or at local and landscape scales and how fire has shaped our landscapes. Where is this? This is all lands, forests and rangelands, the wildland urban interface. Increasingly, wildfires are an urban phenomenon. See cases in California and also the 2020 Almeda fire here in Oregon. Uh, and then also when uh, human ignitions or lightning, plus fuels and the right weather conditions, high temperatures and low humidity, um, as well as the operational response to fire. Uh, next slide, please. So when does fire occur? Um, note that in the case of uh, marine west coast forest fire, activity is mostly caused by human ignition. Uh, in those areas uh, where there are significant lightning uh, ignitions, such as the northwestern forested mountains and the North American deserts, 
uh, humans have lengthened the fire season due to human caused ignitions. Uh, also, uh, due to the seasonality, we can see that July 4th is the day of greatest fire activity caused by human ignitions. Um, the number of wildfires and the extent of wildfires has greatly increased since the 1970s. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these maps show the seasonality of fire with most of the ignitions occurring uh, during August or during July, June, July, and August. Um, also, some human caused ignitions in Northeast Oregon uh, in September, October, November as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, fire season length is increasing. Globally, there's been an 18.7 increase in the global mean fire weather season length. Here in the Pacific Northwest, fire season length increased from about 23 days during the 1970s to about 116 days by 2012. Um, also, the influence of drought and summer precipitation uh, is incredibly important. In the case of coastal temperate rainforests, large areas burned only during years of exceptional drought persisting through the winter and spring preceding the fire season. However, for dry forest types, uh, such as those found in eastern Washington and Oregon, uh, experienced extreme wildfire years even in the absence of persistent drought. So uh, next slide, please. Oh, uh, there's been an increase in the number of days per year of extreme fire danger, a 25 day increase in the annual number of days of regionally widespread fire danger. This has led to a strain on fire resources over the past four decades. Um, and by the mid 21st century, uh, fire resources will be strained in future dangerous prolonged fire seasons. Um, previous slide, apologies. So where fire hits, fire uh, is increasingly frequent within the wildland urban interface. Between 1990 and 2010, there were an increasing uh, number of houses from 30.8 to almost 44 million homes. And then within the perimeter of wildfires for 1990 to 2015, there were 286,000 homes uh, within the perimeter of wildfires in 2010 versus 177,000 in 1990. Uh, the Wee land area extent has increased by 33%. It now comprises approximately 9% of the United States total land area and is projected to double by 2030. So there are increasing populations, increasing number of houses and structures within the wildland urban interface. And then also this wee growth often results in more wildfire ignitions, putting more lives and houses at risks. Uh, next slide, please. So in short, climate change and other factors have greatly increased the extent of wildfires since the 1970s. Wildland fire costs have significantly increased. Wildland fire costs now consume over half of the US Forest Service's budget. Uh, a greater proportion of state and federal agencies budgets are going to wildland firefighting costs. Um, human caused ignitions, lengthening of the fire season, uh, an increase in the number of days of extreme fire weather, as well as less summer precipitation and earlier uh, snow melt. Uh, next slide. So given these circumstances and having the stage set um, I will now turn this webinar over to Daniel Lavelle, who is our statewide fire specialist within the fire program. Uh, Daniel, we're real happy to help you. Um, you have the floor. Thank you. Okay, uh, Aaron, um, I want to thank you and uh, Katie and Jacob for giving me this opportunity. I'm going to share my screen here and bring up this uh, presentation. There. So I was given a task to help people understand how response to wildfires happen. That includes how an incident management team forms, where suppression resources come from, 
and what some major tactics are, for example, backfires, direct versus indirect attack, air support, when it's effective and when not. The goal for this presentation is to demystify the process and help people understand what they are seeing on the news or around them. So I'm going to attempt to do that. Some terms uh, to get across. Uh, one very important one is the authority having jurisdiction. The authority having jurisdiction is an entity uh, delegated to respond to fires, be that Forest Service, be that Oregon Department of Forestry, uh, the uh, whatever agency has the delegation to respond within the area they're responsible for is the authority having jurisdiction to do so. Now, the state of Oregon has a fire service mobilization plan the governor of the state has delegated to the office of state fire marshal to be the authority having jurisdiction on wildland urban interface areas, intermixed areas, um, private, some private land in that area. And Oregon Department of Forestry has been delegated jurisdiction on lands that they are um, uh, tax assessed to protect. Um, and there's a different process on public land, but it's still an authority having jurisdiction because they're delegated to do so. So when a fire occurs, when a smoke happens, when, when somebody notices a fire occurring, no matter what the cause, uh, best thing to do is to call 911. When you call 911, it kicks into the process, the state mobilization plan the authority having jurisdiction, be that a fire department or forest service or BLM or Oregon Department of Forestry uh, will get into gear and respond to the fire. In the state of Oregon, obviously we have an, a tremendous mix of land ownerships, private, public, uh, BLM, park service, forest service, uh, it, it's, it's a hodgepodge of land ownerships that makes authorities having jurisdiction and firefighter response complicated. But through that complication, so much has been put into place to help organize that so that agency authorities having jurisdiction know when to respond, where to respond, how to respond. And that's all in the mobilization guide. That's all in agreements, mutual aid agreements that all these entities have into place. And uh, let's go into a little more, more detail. The National Wildfire Coordinating Group is at a national level and they provide um, the uh, national standards for agencies uh, to respond. And uh, the, all of the federal agencies um, uh, adhere to that. They are a national group. They are broken up into regions. So the National Wildfire Coordinating Group sets the standards for training, for response, for, uh, they set the national standards and they go out, they have regions like the Northwest is the Pacific Northwest Coordinating Group and they work with uh, the national and they standardize all standardized in training and response in uh, capability and resources because the more standardized things are the more order can be brought out of chaos and back in the 70s uh, it, it was determined so much loss through great wildfires in California uh, due to chaos that an, an order an organization system was put together and it's, it's broken out into regions. We're focused on the Northwest and, and they, uh, uh, they, there's uh, Forest Service alone has 10,000 wildland firefighters that no matter where they are stationed, the, uh, the, the standards are the same. There's an interagency resource ordering capability system, a database system that 
connects with state database systems, private contractor database systems, and that's where all of the resources are recorded, um, tabulated, and accessed in case of, of a dispatch and needed. Uh, that's where uh, the training qualifications are, are put in, the, in stored and available for use when the dispatch comes. One example of that is back in 9-11, uh, when the Twin Towers was attacked, um, I was in Northwest Montana uh, on, on, a, on a duty station and watching in real time as the towers were uh, attacked within two minutes. Within two minutes, a dispatcher came into the office and offered me a dispatch to go back east. I couldn't do it, I'm sorry to say, and I didn't, but that's how the system works. Uh, it's that tied together. In the state of Oregon, we have the Pacific Northwest Coordinating Group, and within the state, we have uh, regions like the South Central Oregon Fire Management Partnership for an example. So the National Interagency Fire Center in Boise is a conduit from the National, National Wildfire Coordinating Group, is a conduit to the Pacific Northwest Coordinating Group. That is a conduit to the North South Central Oregon Fire Management Partnership and other partnerships across the state and all coordinate when the fire season starts, what the training standards are, what the preparatory levels are for the agencies responding, what the season projections are, and most of these partnerships, most of these areas have uh, dispatch authority, uh, interagency dispatch authority. Most, because of the 70s wildfires in California that, that screamed for order, uh, an organization, the Incident Command System, was put together uh, back in the 70s and has been uh, going strong ever since. Um, I've worked with this for a long time and know it does work. And this is how an incident is organized. Uh, operations, planning, logistics, finance. It's all organized. Operations does it, planning uh, puts it together. Logistics supports it, finance pays for it. Each incident, uh, every time a wildfire starts, a modified version of this is put into place. It can be extremely complicated on large incidents. You can have over 100,000 acres or bigger. You can have thousands, thousands of resources. Uh, the ICS organization is extremely complicated, but it works. You know, every single person on that organization knows what they're responsible for, who they're responsible to, what they're responsible to do. Uh, it all comes together. It's an, orga it's an organizational um, scheme that, that really works, whether you're on a small uh, fire or whether you're on a large fire. The National uh, Fire Danger Rating System uh, is also put into place. There are detections. Uh, once preparatory levels are high, the whole system shifts into gears. People are watching for smokes, for starts, for um, when, when, that, when it's severe enough, all of these resources are put into place. When you call 911, it kicks into gear to respond. Uh, resources, the incident management teams have been put into place uh, for decades. And uh, there are five types of incident management team the, uh, small, the smaller uh, teams, five and four, and sometimes three are usually local resources. The type two is usually a regional uh, resource put together and a type one are the national teams. Type one teams respond to floods, hurricanes, uh, shuttle crashes, uh, twin towers. Uh, the type one teams are all hazard, all risk teams that, um, are, are specialized to respond to very complicated uh, incidents. Uh, these incidents can be uh, hell attack with two or three crew members off in the middle of nowhere 
to put a fire out and they can involve cities and towns and suburbs and again, thousands of individual resources from skidgens to engines to helicopters to backhoes to thousands of uh, firefighting resources uh, and then shrink back again as, as needed. Each incident management team has a planning process they follow and uh, it's very uh, organized. And this planning process is done every single operating period, every single day. And uh, it, it shows where the uh, incident is organized, uh, be it, uh, again, a 10 acre or a 200,000 acre, uh, the organization is standardized and, and really works. Once that organization is put together, then the operations staff with the plan staff puts together strategy and tactics that are appropriate to the incident, appropriate to the organization of the incident, and everyone works together uh, to achieve the overall incident objectives, be that a backing fire where it's appropriate, uh, flanking fire operations where it's appropriate, direct attack, indirect attack, it all depends on the on these things, whether uh, these are the, the, the standards that we all follow during these incidents, uh, watch out situations, standard firefighting orders, and these have been built on the fatalities that have occurred over the decades. These are, in my term, sacred concepts that need to be followed all of our strategies and tactics, when to do what, why to do what, is geared to this. Following these situations, watch out situations, and standard firefighting orders. Very, very important, prevents fatalities. Out of the 40 plus years I've been doing this, my greatest accomplishment was that out of those thousands of incidents I attended, not one person was was hurt severely or 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 lost their life that's the greatest accomplishment i have so in the minutes remaining i want to shift gears a little bit that was quick we're heading into and i hope others talk about this we're heading into some severe fire conditions please please all of you when a red flag condition surfaces, it's almost too late to put preparation into effect. Go bag, uh, to, to do bag, evacuation route, be alert. Be alert when temperatures exceed 80 degrees in general, when winds are greater than 20 miles per hour in general, when the air moisture is less than 20%. Wherever you are in this state across the nation, these three things are gonna vary a little bit. When they converge, be aware. It's a red flag condition. Fuel is dry enough to burn and it can burn and you need to be aware. Get out your belt weather kit. You can monitor this every day when it's coming close to that. But please, please be aware of those conditions as we head into it. So 15 minutes is almost up. Thank you for listening. And I guess we go into a question and answer session. Um, hello, uh, thank you very much. For your participation, Daniel. Um, we'll actually move on to our next panelist and save questions for the end. Um, so uh, Kelly Burns uh, of Ashland Fire and Rescue, I'll let you go ahead and, and introduce yourself and uh, go ahead and make your presentation. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank Thanks, you. Aaron. Thanks, Carrie, and everybody that's setting this up. And, and thank you, OSU School of Forestry. Hey, hello to everyone in the state. I see that we've got close to uh, two, over 250 participants. And I'm noticing where people are saying they're from. You are all from areas of Oregon that I'm familiar with having grown up here. Um, 
and the fire service. Uh, but let me share with you what I've got for you today. I am going to talk about when wildfire hits. Oh, hang on. There we go. All right, so I'm super excited to be here and I've got a few uh, points just like Daniel had that were asked of me as a structural firefighter. Uh, just know that when you work in Ashland and, and I think Daniel said one of these words, he said, uh, most of the teams that are wildland firefighters are all hazard. Know that your local fire departments typically are all hazard. We are called to everything and, and uh, I could break down some of what our calls are but mostly eight out of 10 calls are medicals. Um, as a firefighter, I'm also a paramedic. Let me get the right finger there. Uh, and then we go to some fires and what we're seeing more and more are these bigger fires and what we're calling urban conflagrations. Um, but let's talk about when wildfire hits and these are perspectives for me, a, a responder, and I'll answer a couple of questions because why, why would you listen to me? Um, I'm gonna answer a couple of questions that I was posed. What, like, what's it like coming to the scene of a wildfire? Um, and I'll give you some direct experience from my experience, uh, which I've been doing this for a while. Uh, and I was the initial in incident commander on the Almeida fire. Uh, and I'll share with you a few things. Uh, I'll talk about our priorities and decisions that we make. I'll talk some of the Almeida fire. Uh, and then my favorite quote that I heard from it is, I don't have a slide for this, which I'll give you some context for that in, in the discussion. And then uh, what can I do to help the firefighters? It's a great question. As a citizen, as someone who's not a responder, what do you do then that is actually going to help us? Because there's only so many of us that are out there, men and women that wear the uniform, that are wearing the badge the day that that call comes in. Um, that's a great question. And so I have a couple of things, which I call an ounce of prevention resources. And as I noticed, and I'm not sure how many of the 250 plus of you that have been watching these webinars, but I see constant themes and I see some redundancy in the information that's coming out. So you're going to see a little bit of that from me and these resources. There's already great resources out there about how to protect your property and, and what to do, how to, um, just like Daniel said, how to get ready to go make a go kit. I'll, I'll still touch on those. It's important that they're said. And then finally, my list of five things. But why would you listen to me? Who am I? I'm Kelly Burns. I'm a battalion chief with Ashland Fire and Rescue, the greatest little fire department in Southern Oregon. Um, I was born in Ashland and I grew up in Alaska, which if you haven't been there, I encourage you to go. Um, I lucked out and got a temporary job with the Ashland Fire Department in 1990. I was gonna move on and do something else, but here I find myself 31 years later and I'm still excited to show up to work. I graduated from SOU, which was formerly Southern Oregon State College. I got a humanities degree. What is a firefighter doing with a humanities degree? Go figure. Um, I, in addition to lots of things that I've done, I was first on scene of the Almeida fire um, and I coordinated our resources and sustained the fight from the beginning to its end 36 hours later. Uh, and really we didn't, and firefighters didn't end the incident 36 hours later. Mother nature did because the wind finally stopped. And that was a, a breath out and, um, a relief for all of us. I have a wife and two daughters. We're calling Ashland our home. And uh, just you know, one more bit about me is I'm more than a Sagittarius who likes long walks on the beach. Okay, let's get into this. So uh, what is it like coming onto the scene of a wildfire? If you have friends that are firefighters, if you yourself are a firefighter, across the firefighting world, East Coast versus West Coast in the United States, we have three priorities that we approach every incident from. And they are listed in, in my slide below. The first one is life. We are there to protect life, to save life. Um, and that's the number one thing that we always need to do. Sometimes based on the, the magnitude of the event, that's all we get to try to do. The second thing we do, if we can handle those life safety things is try to save property, saveable property. Um, and then finally, the, the last thing, which has been important for us as responders from, you know, even from back in the 70s and the 80s, going on to the end of the 90s, is to try to do our best to protect our environment that we're living in. So you'll see some of our prevention efforts in fire service now where we're trying to address you and your neighborhoods, trying to reduce the amount of fuels you have. Um, uh, even in uh, the wildland forest firefighters, and maybe Jennifer will correct me if I get this wrong, 
but they've adapted their own firefighting tactics to include what I think is called MIST tactics, M-I-S-T, which is minimum impact suppression techniques. Because back in the day of wildland firefighting, you just made giant fuel breaks with bulldozers without thinking of the areas you were doing it in. And that causes erosion and it kind of messes up the forest. So protecting the environment is a job of all fire service. Um, but let's just remember the number one is life. We're trying to save you. And I have that quote there. It's important that you see that. Risk a lot to save a lot. Uh, that gets thrown around in the fire service and said a lot. And basically what that means to me and my people is that we will die trying to save you. That's our job. So remember that. All right. So how, knowing our priorities, uh, then how do we make decisions? And if you go to any fire service leadership class, eventually somebody's going to say recognition prime decision making, RPDM. And if you recognize what this is in the picture off to the side, there's this uh, archeological dig that was done that dug these ancient artifacts up, which are called slides. I actually recognize those and I'm pretty sure some of our people do too. And what RPDM basically said is that it's an, it's an experience-based model for making decisions, a person making decisions in an incident in compressed time and needing to make effective actions. And if you have experiences from previous times you've made decisions, you have a slide. And so RPDM basically says that the more slides you have, the more apt you are to make good, effective decisions uh, when you're faced with things. And it's applied to military. It's even now being applied to artificial intelligence with computers, like they're programming this kind of stuff. But for us in the fire service, that's absolutely accurate. If you have a lot of experience, you've got a lot of slides. So when you go to an incident, let's say the Almeida event, um, you try to think of what experience slide is going to help you the most, and then you make decisions based on that. And then the, the next thing, of course, you have to, to keep in mind is that we have standard tactics, and Daniel kind of touched on some of those previous to me. Um, and in the urban area where I'm at, which sometimes touches the forest, we have certain tactics that we try to do as well. They're standard, and you say, hey, we're going to have you anchor and hold in this area which maybe in simple terms is like, we're gonna to try to put an engine in a spot where it's not gonna burn up, but in a spot that they can reach a few structures and then try to push the fire around those structures. It's an anchor and hold. There's a few others like that, but I, I wanna keep us moving. Okay. This picture is from one of our urban conflagrations and, uh, and it, the limits of RPDM, which I will uh, answer again, is that you don't always have a slide. For every situation and uh, I like this picture in some ways because it talks about the challenge that we are faced. This firefighter with his thin but somewhat protective gear is in a situation where his hose line and the amount of water that he has is not going to stop this fire. So how do you solve that puzzle? Well let me tell you a little bit about the Almeda fire. The picture that's in front of you uh, is during the Almeda fire and I want to say that this was one of our neighborhoods in um, in talent that was burning. Uh, early in the morning when this fire went off and then I had assigned our resources. I had, I, the city of Ashland Moore small fire department. I have two engines and two brush rigs for a grass fire. That's what this fire came in as. Normally we're running ambulance calls and the brush rigs are usually people on ambulances. But at that moment when the fire came in, both ambulances were in quarters. So my ambulance guys jumped on the brush rig. Okay, so I got two engines, two brush rigs going to my initial attack on, on the fire. I know that my guys are gonna be fighting the fire. So I also know that this fire is threatening a neighborhood and I'm gonna do, do you one more here on my screen. I've set something up here just so you can see. Well, I can't get it, I can't get it. Something about Zoom won't let me grab my internet connection thing here, but what I can show you behind me on the wall is the first section of the Almeda fire. And I've kept this up here in our training room as, as something that we can look at. But if you look down here, this is where the origin is of the fire. And you can pull up your own Ashland map and Google map and kind of zoom in on it and stuff. And we knew that the wind was blowing this way. I think everybody can see that. And that this area was just kind of a grassy field, but right next to it 
is a neighborhood called Quiet Village with about a hundred homes in it and people. And that fire was blowing right towards that area. So what I needed to do was get my people in between that fire and those homes. And I also needed to get those people out of the way. So I can't spare firefighters to do that. So I send the cops and I know all my local cops too. And I'll always remember when um, one of my cop friends came up to me as we were actively fighting the Alameda to try to keep it small. And I'm contacting our forest service because I know that they might have some helicopters that can drop some water on it too, but I'm talking to them. And one of the cops comes up to me and he goes, hey, Kelly, what do you want? And I'm like, I need you to evacuate uh, the neighborhood there, the, the quiet village neighborhood. And he says, okay, how many? And I said, all of them. And then he stopped for a second, his eyes got big and whew, he turned around and they started doing that. I will say that for the, our initial efforts that we did here, 24 hours later, I was pretty convinced that that neighborhood was gone and it was only because I wasn't receiving any information back. I was still in the fight doing other things and somebody told me, no, we saved that neighborhood. So every now and then there are little victories that we get based on our efforts. I have no slide for this. This comes to me from my uh, Captain Foss, who has worked with me for a lot of years in a lot of different roles. Um, the picture that you see in front of you that's part of my PowerPoint slide is a set of condos behind that firefighter that are fully involved. There's about five units and they stretch all the way down to the end of a flag lot. The other side that you can see is a guy way off in the distance there under a carport, which was another section of condos about five deep on the flag lot. This first section was on fire and Captain Foss and his crew of two showed up with one engine and a failing water system, which when do water systems fail? Apparently during big events. And he's like, okay, I think if we deploy a few lines into this little flag lot area by the carports, we can protect this unburned section of condos. And that was a good idea, good tactic between he and another firefighter. They can put some hose lines out. They can keep the unburned home the homes, the condos from burning. Great. The ones that are on fire, nobody's in them. Everybody's been evacuated. Thank goodness. That's our first priority. But they just have to let those go because they don't have enough water or personnel or anything to put it all out. So they start spraying water and cooling it. And this looks like it's working uh, from what they can see. And then my captain hears an explosion. Boom. And he hears a second one. Boom. And it's happening on the other side of these unburned condos. And he's staring at him. He's like, what would be exploding on that unburned side? So he dashes up to the front door of one of them, opens it up. He can see all the way through, through the glass door. And the gas meters on the back side of the unburned condos are blowing up. The only way that we figured this out is that there must have been an underground fire because these condos were somewhat connected with their utilities. Perhaps that's what happened. We didn't dig it up to figure it out. What we knew in that moment is that the gas meters on the unburned condos were exploding and we lost that whole other set of condos. So J Justin actually told me later, he's like, I have no slide for this. I've never seen anything like that. The water system failure was something else too, that even though we're faced with these things that are like, wow, this is really unfamiliar. We've never seen this before. We have to adapt. Uh, so when the water system failed in talent, we figured out that there was one hydrant all the way three miles back towards Ashland that we could fill from. And so in a row of engines along Talon Avenue, we sustained a fight to keep the fire from crossing Talon Avenue and burning the rest of Talon by taking three engines. One engine would drive all the way back to, to the hydrant, all the way three miles back to Ashland, fill up and come back while the other two sustained the fight and just tried to stop the fire. A lot of good stories there from our firefighters, a lot of experiences that we just don't really see that much of. We learned a few things. So what's it like coming to a scene of a wildfire? We have our standard orders. We have our life, property, and environment that we try to protect. And then we've got a few slides that we try to make the best decisions from. Finally, what can I do to help the firefighters? I'm a citizen. I'm, I was involved. I tried to evacuate, you know, and it didn't really work that well. What do I do? Well, I'm going to tell you that much of what you're learning in these webinars is repeated information. And I like old Ben Franklin because uh, he reminds us that an ounce of prevention, pre prevention is worth a pound of cure. And we can tell where our silly hats came from, uh, Ben, clearly. Uh, so I actually like the OSU wildfire resource when uh, before wildfire strikes. It's an entire PDF. It's super wordy. If you're like me, and I know I am, 
than you like to read. And it's got lots of details as to like how to prepare your home, how to get out of your home, how to make a kit. It has all of that stuff in it. It's circa 2015, but the, the information in it is great. So I actually highly recommend that. And if I could show my internet thing, I'd pull it up for you so you can see what it looks like. Trust me, it's there. The next thing that I, that I wanna show you is that listen to my friends in Ashland and my friends are the wildfire division, which are Chris Chambers, Katie Gibble, Brian Hendricks, and they've been working on this a lot. So have all your OSU forestry people been working on this a lot. And they're talking to you about, you know, hey, maybe maintain some distance of the fuels from your house. Don't grow your shrubs and bushes right up against there. Wooden fences, I don't know. Maybe we should start doing some different kinds of fences that don't burn. Clean your gutters. Well, my people with um, fireadaptedashland.org have a brilliant website, easy links to follow with specific information for you as a property owner, as a homeowner, as to how to prepare for these kind of things. I highly recommend it. Go to fireadaptedashland.org. And again, this information is everywhere. And it's uh, for our OSU forest, forestry folks, they've got lots of resources. It says most of the same things. Eh, my heart's in Ashland, so I'm going to tell you to go to Ashland. All right, here's my list of five things that you can do to help the firefighters. Um, and I'm just about, oh, I got a couple minutes left. We're doing great. Hey, so, uh, <laughs> and I'm just about done. So five things that are helpful. They should be super easy. Make a plan now and practice it. It's like a fire drill when you went to school. You just did it. Practice how to get out of your house. Practice how to drive to some place that's got some space around it where you know you can hold up for a few hours until a fire front passes. Expect that when the fire hits, it's going to be hard to see and people are going to be wound up. If you practice something, it's actually going to help you stay calmer if you've done it before. So practice that. Vehicles, if you're driving and you're thinking, ah, which way do I go now and stuff too, just a couple of things. One is, is keep your lights on, all right? It's not always going to be easy to see things. There will be smoke. There might be embers. There will be people getting in your way. Um, and my number five thing is, is going to address some of that. Home prep. Do it before the fire. Do it right now. What are you doing sitting here watching this webinar? Please go prep your homes uh, a little better. That actually helps us when we get there. If you've taken care to move like wood piles away and taken your lawn furniture that you got from Ikea or something like that, move that away from your house um, and just done some things to prep your home so that it's more resilient in a fire. Perfect. Clean your gutters. Uh, finally, if you're told to evacuate, evacuate. Uh, we had a, a few occasions where people were like, no, we're staying. And it's like, huh, boy, okay, all right, well, we're going to try and come save your life when the fire's coming and the fire came through. And lucky for us, most people evacuated. So if you're told to evacuate, I appreciate it if you do. And finally, kindness matters. Everybody's spun up in these things, everybody's, you know, got their priorities and stuff. But mostly, like, spend your time helping others if you can. Hi, Aaron. I'm going to wrap this up. Homework for you, because my best teacher always gave me homework, is do one of the following by next Tuesday. And bonus, maybe do two of these things. Um, if some of these seem unreasonable, go for the most reasonable ones. Number one, master kung fu. That's always good for you. Find the cure for cancer. Find your nemesis. Earn their trust and then vanquish them, preferably with magic. I wouldn't be able to do that. But four and five, do a fire or an evac drill. That's really going to help make a plan and practice it. And finally put together a to-go kit. Simple things they have been said before. The last thing I'll leave you with is Teddy Roosevelt. I think he said the right thing. And I've had fire chiefs tell me the same thing over the last year as we have decreasing resources and it's harder for us to do the job as 911 calls have skyrocketed. Do what you can with what you have, where you're at. Um, thanks, I appreciate the time and, and listening and thanks. If you have questions, I will do my best to respond to you. You can tell I like doing what I do. So um, I'm here for you, it's my job. You are my number one priority. Thanks, Aaron, and thanks, OSU. Hey, really, really appreciate that, Kelly. Thank you so much. If you could uh, stop sharing your screen, um, we'll move on to Jennifer Case is joining us from Oregon Department of Forestry. Um, I'll let Jennifer introduce herself, but she's based in the Klamath unit of ODF and is also a public information officer. So thanks so much for joining us, Jennifer. Yes, thank you, Aaron. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, tuning in. I'm excited to uh, speak on fire information. A uh, little background about myself. I started in 2009 here at the Oregon Department of Forestry on the Klamath Lake District as a seasonal firefighter uh, as I was going to school. Uh, fell in love with the department. I didn't get a degree 
in this, I psychology wanted to be a teacher, but I've just, I've really been passionate about um, Oregon Department of Forestry and what they stand for. Um, and then I got into a natural resource specialist. I've been doing prevention now for a few years and I really enjoy, um, you know, doing the prevention work, you know, field mitigation uh, work prior to, to fire season. And so, you know, going along with what Kelly Burns said about, uh, you know, having defensible space and cutting those, uh, cutting that stuff out, that's really what I'm passionate about. But uh, got into uh, public information uh, or fire information um, as a request, our unit just really needed somebody and um, it's been great so far. Um, so today I'm going to be touching on um, a little bit of fire information, what the public's going to hear, um, some terminology, uh, as firefighters, we get into a um, just, you know, uh, acronyms, really, you know, I see uh, and, and we get into acronyms, whereas a lot of the public isn't going to know what that means. So I'm going to show you or, or tell you a few things that um, is uh, some of the terminology that is used quite often and where you can find um where you can find some of this terminology um, if you, you're hearing this on the, the news, um, newspapers. And, and so we'll go with that. And then I'm also gonna talk a little bit about uh, what you may hear from a public information officer, where, where you can get your information from, what you can trust um, out there now, you know, with, with social media, that's such a, a large one that um, so many rumor mills go around. And so it's hard to know what you can trust. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and some, um, some common misunderstandings um, in FIRE. Uh, again, I think a lot of that's going to go with terminology, um, but we'll just talk a few on that. Um, and so we'll go from there. There we go. So FIRE terminology, I'm not going to read these word for word. Um, everyone can read, but I'll just kind of touch on this. Um, Daniel talked about the um, National Wildfire Coordinating Group in WCG.gov. They have a, uh, a glossary in there where you can look up common terminology. Uh, it's going to be the basics, you know, across the states. Um, so your containment, you're going to hear containment um, a lot when um, when focused around wildfire, a lot of folks want to know how contained is it, you know, it's a safety thing. Um, so basically, it's going to talk about control lines. Um, and, um, and basically the, how the fire stopped and spread. Uh, you can have a fire 100% lined, but you still don't have it contained. There is a um, possibility that it will jump those lines and then you know continue on. And so uh, that's when you get into control. So you'll hear people talk maybe about containment versus it being controlled. 100% controlled, meaning um, that it's most likely not in um, basic conditions or everyday conditions, not going to uh, then go into a wildfire. Uh, mop up, that's another one that you are going to hear um, when uh, getting updates on fires that um, firefighters are in mop up stage, meaning that they're extinguishing uh, those burning materials um, and they're removing a lot of hazards, um, whether it be on the line or uh, internally um, or interior in the, in the fire. Uh, so out of control or uncontrolled fires um, is another one that I thought was um, one that we should touch on. Uh, you know, preseason, we have a lot of prescribed fire um, that sometimes may uh, go into uncontrolled. And so uh, we had one this year and our fire management just did a great job of deeming that an uncontrolled fire um, and getting the uh, appropriate resources to help fight that fire. Um, so initial attack, I know uh, Daniel Lavelle, as well as Kelly, talked about initial attack, um, whether it be direct or indirect. So during initial attack, when you go direct, um, you are very close to the fire um, in the burning fuels. Uh, you are either wetting it, smothering it, um, going direct with the hand line, so right on the fire's edge. Um, indirect is when a fire is very large um, and has very um, large flame lengths. And so you can't necessarily go direct with your line, um, but you know, a lot of fire folks go in afterwards to clean up that unburned fuel in between uh, the fire's edge um, and fire's edge. Uh, so next, during a wildfire, wait, what you may hear from um, a, a public affairs officer who works with 
a department or a um, public information officer. So you're going to get basic facts. Um, during an initial attack, um, it's, it's very difficult to get all of the information gathered up. You know, your IC, incident commander, is busy with um, lining out resources and getting resources, you know, getting um, folks lined out really. And so it's going to be hard to get the basic facts right off the bat. And, and uh, as, the public, it's a need for folks to want to know information uh, right away, whether it be a safety issue. Um, and so uh, as public information officers, we try to get those as, as quickly as possible. You know, it may take a couple hours. We, we've just had a few incidents this last Memorial Day weekend, and it was difficult to get the information from the IC because they were um, not in service, in phone service. And so as public information officers, we rely on what we hear from the radio traffic. We'll call local dispatch um, to get those answers. And so you're gonna be hearing, or what you'll get is the, the type of the incident, typically a wildfire, um, Kelly touched on uh, all hazards. Um, uh, PIOs work on all hazards, So, but um, you're gonna get the type of incident, uh, location, so the agency with the jurisdictional authority, Daniel touched on that, uh, threats to life, property, and resources. So with that is going to go evacuations. Um, I suggest signing up for alerts in your county um, as those are going to be the uh, most up-to-date. Your, your uh, emergency manage um, mint will, will send those out. Uh, time of the incident, um, when it started and who reported it, uh, the size of the fire, containment and cause. Um, a lot of folks are, are always asking about cause and, and typically that's gonna be under investigation until um, a fire investigator goes in and does uh, an appropriate uh, investigation of that fire, but it's it's on there. Um, you can see up in the upper right hand corner, uh, that was a 242 fire. I was a part of that just kind of as a trainee um, with our type one incident management two team. Um, those are those updates that go out um, morning and night. Uh, it's gonna give you your size containment. You can kind of see everything over here um, on this side. Um, you know, you have cost in there uh, and, it, and it's gonna depend on what the type of incident. This was a type one incident. So you're gonna have a little bit more information. When you have a type four incident, type three local team, uh, it'll be a little bit different information, but all basically the same. You're gonna have a summary of what the crews did either during the day, uh, what the crews did at night, um, usually uh, maybe a, a blurb um, from either um, the IC uh, operations section chief, John Pellisier, he gave, a, um, uh, gave us a little quote. Um, we had a video. So everything, it's gonna depend on the type of incident, what you get in those fire updates. Okay, so information sources you can trust, where you're gonna hear your news. So typically when um, we type up a news release, we will send those out to the news outlets. Uh, so whether that be TV, radio, newspapers. And so they're typically going to take that news release directly and either post it on their Facebook um, or their website, whatever they may have, um, or even um, on their news um, station. Uh, so those will directly come from us. Um, there was a time yesterday actually one of the we had emerging an emerging incident and the tv um uh the news outlet was there and so they were getting the scoop uh, before anybody else did and so um that happens as well but typically um we'll send out news releases and that's where those come from uh so also your local fire agency social media uh, a lot of agencies have facebook and twitter accounts you can see here um our South Central Oregon Fire Management Partnership, SCAFUMP, they have a um, Facebook page. He posts regularly to that. I work with him. His name is David Duncan. I work with him and Tamara Schmidt. She's the um, Forest Service uh, PAO over there. And so we work together and, um, and get this partnership of all of our agencies um, all of the information out on those. There's also agency web pages. You can see down here in the lower right-hand corner, um, you can get on those types of things. I suggest maybe finding those um, on there. When you have larger incidents, uh, like the 242 fire last year, um, there's public information lines that you can call and get information. Um, you'll see this again was a, a social media um, 
page that they made for this larger incident. So when you have these larger incidents, again, type one uh, incident, they they typically make social media pages as that's just kind of the way of, of news outlets these days. Uh, you can get it directly from the incident management team. They had an email on there. They had phone numbers that you can call the information line. Um, and then trap lines, another uh, place where you can get information. Um, it's typically, again, on those larger incidences, though, um, where you go in and can meet face to face with someone who's working um, on that team um, and get information, real time information. Um, and so, oh, and then common misunderstanding. So contained versus controlled. I think I touched on that a little bit when we were talking about um, um, the terminology. Uh, so again, sometimes folks, you'll hear folks say the, the fire is controlled when it's um, lined, stuff like that, or even contained when it's 100% lined, uh, not, not necessarily true. Um, the other common misunderstanding that I see a lot is evacuation level. So you're ready, set, go, ready. Um, so at times, again, I'm gonna keep going back to the 242 just because it's so fresh on my mind. A lot of lessons learned from that fire. Um, some folks in that area, it being a wooey area, wildland urban interface area, uh, a lot of folks, The there's a lot of folks in the area that live down two track roads and, and weren't maybe notified. Um, and so, and I, I know a lot of folks also got the get ready um, or the ready, uh, notification, but they never were told to go. Um, and again, it just depends on the emergent incident. Um, it may jump from a, a wildland incident and then all the way to go. And so you don't get that ready, set, and go. Um, another issue that we ran into was the because of that Labor Day weekend and how many fires were going across Oregon at that time, um, the news outlets were so overwhelmed with all of the information they were getting and they were trying to pick and choose what to put on. Um, and, and, you know, our 14,000 acre fire here in Chiloquin um, was small compared to the rest of the state. Um, and so underneath on one of the captions, it was saying that uh, this Chiloquin area, uh, Oregon Shores, it was, was still in a, a uh, an evacuation level three. And so that was a misunderstanding. So, uh, you know, when, when instances like that happen, it's really useful to have those alerts um, for evacuations as well as getting on local um, uh, social medias or websites. Um, oh, I keep going backwards. I apologize. Um, and then the other um, misunderstanding is initial attack versus extended attack. I just kind of wanted to touch on that briefly. I think Daniel may have uh, mentioned it, but initial attack being um, the first resources to uh, arrive on scene of that fire could be anywhere from 24, 36 hours. It, it really just depends. Um, and then extended attack goes beyond initial response. Um, and yeah, so that's all I have. Thank you so much for tuning in and everyone have a safe summer. If there's any questions or something that I can answer, uh, please feel free to email me. Uh, hey, uh, thank you so much, Jennifer. Really appreciate your presentation. Um, just been informed by our moderator, Katie, that we have a couple of questions that we could handle quickly before we have to, um, before we have to uh, cut it short. Yes, You're thank you to all our panelists. Um, yeah, a quick one for Jennifer, since uh, we just heard from you. Can you explain to the audience what a trap line is? There we go. Uh, a trap line. Sorry, that was something that I didn't even know. When I first started, I got kind of thrown to the wolves on this. But a trap line is a board, a billboard, typically, or not a billboard, sorry, a um, a board typically where folks in the community, maybe at a community center, can come um, to and get, you know, the maps, they can see the updates and to, you can talk to a, a person um, about that, usually a, a public information officer assigned to the fire. Um, so those are typically what trap lines are in there. Um, yeah, posted throughout usually the town, uh, again, on bigger incidences such as, you know, type one, type two. So you're not going to see those on the smaller fires though. Great. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we have a quick one for Kelly here. Um, well, maybe it's not so quick. Do you feel like firefighters have adequate resources to recover after this really challenging fire season last year, like the Alameda fire? Um, yeah, and that's that's not necessarily a quick answer. I do appreciate the question. Um, your 
local fire service, even in your metropolitan areas, your rural areas and stuff like we're all experiencing right now, just an increase, an escalation in what our expectations of what we're able to do and a decrease in what we're actually able to do. Um, right now, just speaking for Ashland, we are in, um, we're on a path for our two stations with our minimum of eight personnel per day. We're going to probably exceed 5,000 calls for service. So while the Almeda event was all hands on deck, uh, we got as many people coming back to help try to fight the fire in the event. Um, the next day, there's all these other 911 calls that are still coming in. The next month, there's still all these 911 calls. So we are still under this constant level of pressure. So are there resources? You know, Ashland's pretty great. We got this reputation for being a, a little hippie now and then. So we have like people that have reached out and said, hey, we can do therapy with you. Um, hey, we can do massages for you and things like that, which is great. It's, it's wonderful. But it doesn't work for everybody. And everybody's got their, got their own stuff. Um, I think that as a team, our Ashland folks, like we tend to get together and we talk about things more than most. Uh, and that's super helpful. But, you know, is, is there enough? I, 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 I think for personal health, there's probably plenty. It's whether or not you can make that horse drink water once you, you know, bring the horse to water. Uh, and, and again, we all handle it differently. So me, I'm super determined. I'm still like in the game and in the fight. Uh, and I will not stop this next season. Like and, until we get some rain in October, I'd be okay if we got rain in August and July though too. Okay, um, uh, could you please advance the slide please? Okay, so now what? Take action, there were calls to action um, by our panelists, including Kelly. Um, but some other additional calls to action that the OSU fire team and forestry agents have come up with are one, make sure your access, your ingress and egress and evacuation routes are cleared of shrubs on each side, well marked with turnarounds if possible. Uh, clear roofs of accumulated needles and other organic debris from overstory trees and winds. Uh, keep debris from piling up around the structures determine how to receive or look for evacuation information. So sign up for those county emergency alerts. Uh, establish a phone tree within your neighborhood or community. Uh, and next slide, please. Okay, next slide. All right, thank you uh, to the presenters and the panelists that made this webinar happen and to all of you for joining us. We recognize we are still recovering from a really hard fire season and we appreciate you turning in, tuning into these webinars to get yourselves, your family and your communities prepared for the next wildfire season. Don't forget to join us two weeks from now, same day and time, Wildfire Wednesdays at 12 noon on June 16th. This webinar will cover recovery after a fire when a fire threatens a community, it can be an emotional, scary, and traumatic experience, especially if you had to evacuate. There can be a lot of uncertainty around how long an evacuation may last, when it is safe to return, what you might find when you do. Join us to hear from experts that will discuss what happens after the fire and address some of these uncertainties, including the factors authorities are using to determine when it is safe to return, what to know and expect upon returning, assessing your home and property for damage, important calls to make, and what resources and assistance are available if you've been affected by fire. A reminder that this webinar has been recorded and feel free to share it out. We will send a follow-up email with all the resources, including the Q&A that wasn't answered. Uh, stay safe, everyone. See you in two weeks for Wildfire Wednesdays, Fire Aware, Fire Prepared. Uh, thank you all, have a good afternoon.